So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, January the 7th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 141. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So I'm glad that you're here, and if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description right here to find out, line item by line item, the topics that we're going to cover. This is going to be a short one. So I hope things are going great for you. These questions were submitted during the past week, and if you'd like to know how to submit your own question, please follow the link in the video description, which takes you to my website, which shows you a form that you can fill out. You can even be anonymous, as long as you're going to be nice about it. So let's jump right in. The very first question comes from Kevin Stone from Woodbury, Connecticut. Is it possible to feed Man Lake Pro Sweet during a winter during below freezing weather? I understand it's more expensive, but if it's beneficial over dry sugar, I'd be happy to do it. So here's the thing. What is Pro Sweet anyway? So for those of you who don't know, when it comes wintertime, a lot of people are looking for ways to supplement the feeding for their bees. So when do you need to feed your bees? When they're at risk of exceeding the resources that they've already stored. And then we talk about what resources they might have stored going into fall, which is a critical time, which is why you should not take off too much honey and resources from your hives. We leave pollen frames in there that they've stored because they need the pollen in midwinter also. And we leave the honey that they've capped and stored and then, heaven forbid, they get up to the top of their hive and now they're looking for other resources. So, before I get into the Pro Sweet, which is a liquid, it's a syrup, it's an invertase, which means it's already taken the fructose or sucrose and converted it to glucose and fructose, which are smaller molecules immediately digestible by the bees. So almost across the board, you'll have people tell you, myself included, that uh, you want to stop feeding syrup. So when you get to when the winter comes in and it starts giving you frozen nights, so below 32 degrees Fahrenheit at night and below zero degrees Fahrenheit Celsius, when it starts freezing like that, uh, the bees are clustered. So the bees are clustered inside the hive and then we worry about humidity inside the hive. But I'm going to tell you there might be an exception, although this year you may ask, what am I feeding? 50% of my colonies are still getting dry sugar, which is on top, which now is on the insulated inner covers that I'm trying out this year. There are a lot of new things going on that we won't know the result of until spring. So the insulated inner covers are there, and on top of these insulated inner covers, there's a little hole. And what we can provide on top of that hole, on top of the insulation that the bees now have access to when they come up underneath, Heaven forbid, again, that they've consumed, consumed the resources that they've stored for winter. Solid feed comes in the form, for me, if you buy a winter patty, that's fine too. I don't buy them. They're super expensive. Uh, I like to put dry sugar in, so 50% of my colonies have dry sugar in a rapid round. And they also use the moisture, the condensation that builds up inside the hive, to help them metabolize and dissolve away the solids in those dry sugar feeders. Another thing that we're trying this year, and a lot of beekeepers across the board on YouTube, if you're seeing YouTube about backyard beekeeping anywhere, they're all putting out Hive Alive fondant this year. So rather than put this on every hive in my apiary, I put this on 50% of them. So now I have two solid offerings. So this is really the Hive Alive fondant patties are semi-solid. And the cool thing too is the company contacted me and I am authorized to give you a discount for it, Fred10. I'll put that down in the video description too. So Hive Alive puts it out there. But what if you wanted to put a syrup on? So we know that when we're mixing up syrup ourselves, the heaviest syrup that we mix, because it's really difficult, you have to heat the water to put a high sugar content into syrup. So two to one tends to be what gets used and that's going into fall before the freeze starts, right? So then we have honey. What if something came very close to honey in its consistency and therefore did not contribute a lot of moisture to the hive while the bees consume it? Well, that would be ProSweet, which is made by Man Lake. Nothing to do with promoting that or anything else. I'm just telling you about it because it's being asked about and I've been using it as an open feed 
in the fall because the bees do store it just like honey. And much like honey, it doesn't have to be dehydrated down. So where I would normally say no syrup after it gets cold, we can make an exception for full strength ProSweet. ProSweet's expensive. That's why a lot of people cut it with water. If you're going to cut it with water, I would say no. If you're going to leave it as is, full strength. Because if you've ever poured pour sweet as I <clears throat> pro sweet as I have, you know, from the five gallon bucket into a container that I'm going to open feed. I'm going to talk about that too a little bit in a second. Uh, it pours very slow. In fact, it pours and demonstrates that it's more viscous even than honey. So I would be okay with feeding pro sweet, but what we want to be very careful about is open surface area with these heavy syrups, right? So you could not, and I do not recommend ever putting full strength pro sweet in a rapid round feeder. So we know these, this is an example of a rapid round feeder because even underneath this clear inner cover, there's a lot of surface area here. And if it's one-to-one -one syrup, the thin stuff that we feed in spring for those colonies that are needing a kickstart, they can get in and out of a light syrup like that. So one-to-one, -one, equal parts sugar, equal parts water. Bees can be pushed into that, get a little wet. They can still get out, still make it. On the other hand, if it's two-to-one or thicker and they hit the open surface area in there and the bees get down in it, they often can't get out. It's just heavy. It's like molasses and it bogs them down. So I would not recommend putting Pro Sweet in a feeder like this. So then you might ask, well, what then could you put it in? And what would you recommend if I was going to put it on my hive in the wintertime? And this would work, especially for southern states. We're in the state of Pennsylvania here. It's in the 20s right now. And uh, you could put it in an inverted jar. Oh, I happen to have one handy. So if you put Pro Sweet in this full strength, right? And then you've got a metal lid in here that has holes drilled in it. See that? So if we put that in here, and this was full of Pro Sweet, and then you put this on top of your inner cover, inverted just like that, what happens is this fills up with air as the syrup goes down. The bees use it. There's quite a few holes here. And so the bees will connect to the holes up here, stick their tongues up in there and draw out the syrup as they need it. Up here, the temperature of this is going to be the temperature of the outside of your hive. Even if it's on an insulated inner cover and you've got an insulated box around it, which is my latest configuration. And then you've got an insulated outer cover, which for me is a B-Max cover. Up in this area around your feed, it's not going to warm up. So can the bees drink it down here? Well, they do because the cluster gets up against this. And what they're doing is they're warming it just at the surface that they're taking it in. So this is a very slow method for them to take in syrup. And remember, I'm not suggesting that you get honey from anywhere. I'm suggesting, unless you know that the honey is from the hive, that you're feeding because we don't want to take a chance on passing on pathogens to other hives. So I've covered that. The other thing I've said is that pro sweet's expensive. Does it cost more than actual honey? No. So pro sweet is not only going to be metabolized by your bees better, but it is also going to be less expensive than feeding them honey back. And it is not going to have the particulates in it that would cause them to have dysentery if they couldn't do cleansing flights. Even with darker honey, they can suffer from dysentery. And that's diarrhea. They squirt it out when they get out there. Which, by the way, a lot of people are confusing with nosema serrana. So if they have nosema spores, it can affect their gut bacteria, their ability to digest, and their overall health and well-being. But it does not manifest itself. One of the symptoms of nosema serrana is not diarrhea on the front of your beehive. So don't make that assumption that if you see bees eliminating on the front of your hive, that, oh, they've got nosema, because it's another thing altogether. So the problem with this is, too, they can drink the heavy syrup, Pro Sweet only, that's all I'm recommending. 
And then as this comes down, we have temperature fluxes here in the northeastern United States. It could be 17 degrees at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now we've got this airspace. Now as we go from 17 degrees up to 40 degrees by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the air up here is going to expand because this cavity up here is also going to warm gradually because it's insulated now. An uninsulated cavity warms much quicker, but all of mine are insulated now. So then they expand and it will start to push out the syrup. Where's the hole? Directly over the cluster, probably. So you want to make sure that the bees can handle that. So this might be too much surface area if you're up north, right? So now we're going to talk about another style of feeder. And it's the one that's in the cover image for today. This is a very familiar look, but look at the tank shape on this thing. Bee Smart Designs in the past made those big white tanks that were one gallon tank feeders for inside your hive on top of your inner cover. And uh, what happened was this tank itself was not made out of rigid enough material and it would settle down. In fact, I made, a, I made another version of it with the white tank. Oh, I don't have it handy. And I shimmed it all up so that the top would not mushroom down under the weight of the sugar syrup, which even was normally one-to-one. -one. So even the light sugar syrup would push the tank down and it would express syrup out the bottom. This tank, listen, this tank is a totally different thing. It's much stronger. And so the reason for that is it will not settle in. Instructions come inside of it. But this also holds a gallon, even though this tank looks like it's uh, smaller than a gallon. It's not. But notice how it takes on a water tower shape here that added structural strength to this. So you cannot compress this even with your big muscles. You can't push this down. So now, if I were going to feed ProSuite on a hive, because look at the comparison, the feeder spuds here are very small, and there's only a few of them right in the center, and there's a gasket here that seals it up. But one of the things that uh, this feeder has on the bottom of it is look at these ridges right here. See these? It looks like they're going to raise this off of your inner cover about an eighth of an inch, which means what? That means that through that feeder hole, you're going to have airflow. And for me in my hive, uh, I don't want airflow through the top. I don't want that heat capsule that they create up in the top, especially in winter. Uh, I don't want that to vent off and cause my bees to go into overdrive, plus causes a condensation issue up there. So I went online and I got a flexible silicone o-ring. And guess what? If I put that on the bottom here, it goes inside the ribs and surrounds the center spud. So when I put this on top of my inner cover, I have a complete seal here. And the bees can come up and they can get this syrup. And this is going to hold an entire gallon. But Fred, want a gallon spoil in wintertime? By the way, this will also fit in a medium box. So if that's your feeder shim, you're in great shape. So this is an alternative. I'm giving you choices on how to deliver that. But if I were going to put ProSuite inside a tankard and put it on a hive, then this would probably be the one that I would use. And uh, let's hope we get some cleansing flight days. Now, if you wanted to fail safe though, because look at the volume here too, right? So if it's a small colony, like, uh, let's say you wanted to put this completely exposed and put this outside, you would have to strap it down. It's probably not gonna work that well exposed on the top of a hive, like one of your nucleus colonies that might just have a migratory cover then you drill a little hole in it and sit this on top this is going to be up to strap be strapped down and held in place so i'm not recommending that in winter but the volume here so once this is halfway down and then let's go through the thermal dynamics again of uh, you get a cold night 
warm day comes up now look at all the air volume in here that you've got expanding in this tank and this tank we already know is very unforgiving it will express probably even more heavy syrup down onto the cluster so it's a risk right so you're probably in better shape with just the small jar for winter feeding of pro sweet now once you get into spring you're trying to boost the colony and things like that that thing holds a gallon that's good to go you just hived a swarm and you want to build those up this tank is going to be what we're going to see in my beehives in spring and that includes my horizontal long langstroth hive so it's more expensive yes pro sweet is it's better though for many reasons and because it's so thick it's just like putting honey in the hive which means you're not contributing a lot to the moisture so there you go took a long time to answer one question and if you have other questions please put them down in the comment section below this video next question number two comes from ross power hillsboro new hampshire this year will be my first year with bees and i am in new hampshire and will be getting three nukes in april so three nucleus colonies ready to go queen all stages of brood everything's good to go i followed your advice and built a few slatted boards which we call slatted racks and uh, screen bottom boards and your style of feeder shims so my feeder shims if you look them up by the way i would like to mention about my feeder shims i no longer put uh, screens in them because the bees across the board seal up all screens going into the feeder shim to vent out through the top they seal them with propolis so i no longer put those in the other thing is the feeder shims will look like a regular box because they won't have that control wheel on the front anymore which used to be wide open queen excluder vented and so on because they thought we were going to be venting through the top and would need to control that but because the bees decided otherwise and sealed it all up with propolis no more front uh, wheel there no control so the feeder shim, the other thing is we want to insulate our feeder shim inner cover portion too. And you can do that just by putting rigid insulation in there if you want to. So I just wanted to get on that a little bit. And uh, what do you think about the following planned configuration? One, for the bottom, screened bottom board. Now, screened bottom board with an insert. So keep in mind, screened bottom boards, and if we're in the cold, and New Hampshire's cold, this is an example of a screened bottom board. And this is the entrance. This is what it looks like from underneath. And this is core flute that you can pull out and replace. The reason I like this one is because, look, it's easy to close up across the back. So if you are going to be doing oxalic acid vaporization and things like that, uh, this is probably okay. But one of the things I do not like is when you pull this out and your insert's missing, the screen is open right to the bottom so if we're talking about bottom boards and you want a screen this looks like number eight screen which means the openings are eighth of an inch uh not so that pests can fall through and get away from the bees and hopefully not find their way back up but i like to have a solid bottom underneath your removable screen so that even when you've pulled out that insert for whatever reason this bottom isn't exposed and putting the scent of all the honey that they've collected and everything else out of the hive everywhere plus your bees have a hard time controlling the flow of air in a hive that has a wide open screen bottom board like that now when your insert is in fine everything is great but i like the configurations that have a solid bottom board and the removable insert and in a perfect world a removable tray so let me get this back in there So that's a screen bottom board, not terrible, but if I were setting you up and you said, hey Fred, what kind of bottom board should I use in New Hampshire? I would be saying solid bottom board tilted towards the landing board. So now we're going to move up from that slatted board. That's a slatted rack right on top of this. Good utility, good thing to have. I like that story. And then brood box. So the very next box above that is your brood box, then beyond that medium super it says right here reserve honey just for them good choice we have a deep and a medium just for the bees none of that is for you the beekeeper so then above that then he puts a flow hive super 
which that's a flow hive over there. So you can just get a flow hive super, which has the flow frames in it. And then above that, the feeder shim, which is our auxiliary feed. It's also supporting your outer cover, telescoping cover. And it is a less expensive way to put a flow mechanism on your hive rather than buying a whole flow hive. Build a Langstroth hive as described here. Everything about this configuration sounds good to me. And then of course, uh, put your flow super only on top if your colony is strong enough. And that leads us to the next question. It's right down here. So I like that configuration. Let's just do a quick review of it right here. It's got the screen bottom board, which I would prefer solid. Slatted rack, good job. Two inch space, easy if you're doing OAV and things like that. Your root box is next. Medium super just for honey, just for the bees is next. And then your flow super or another honey super, which would be a medium if you're going up above that. Feeder shim, telescoping cover, hopefully an insulated cover, insulated inner cover if you can manage it. So then the next question is, I'm, uh, if I'm correct to start with just the single deep and the feeder to get the cone built out and then add the medium super, wait for that to build out and then add the flow super, exactly. So for those of you who are buying brand new configurations, brand new bee kits, maybe you got one for Christmas. You got this whole kit. Double deeps, three mediums, solid bottom board, everything all at once. A lot of new beekeepers tend to put everything together, get really excited, put your bees in that bottom brood box, and then put the whole thing together. Okay, so that's not a good idea because we want the bees to be able to manage the space they're in, and the space should be appropriate for the population, for the number of bees that you're going to put in there. So always, whether it's an eight or 10 frame brood box, you should start with just a brood box, the bottom board and slatted rack is described here. 18 inches up off the ground if you're in skunk country. And then leave it like that and do your feeding with something like this or your jar with the, with the holes on it and things like that to get them started. And if there's a strong nectar flow, they won't even need your auxiliary feed. And then yes, after that builds out, 7th or 8th frame, so out of 10. 6th or 7th frame out of 8. Once they're filling that and you're seeing that they're making great progress, then add that second uh, medium super on. And then let them fill that out also, 70%, whatever size you have. And then you go on with your flow super and that would include your queen excluder of course underneath your flow super if you want to make sure that the queen cannot lay in there. So my plans are to remove the flow super in the fall. Good idea. Don't want those to go through winter. And pull the queen separator which is really the queen excluder and uh, leave them with the medium super full of honey. So almost 50 pounds of honey to get them through winter there and feed them two to one in a rapid round. That's where I draw the line. And it's because of what we talked about with question number one. If you put two to one syrup in your rapid round feeder, count on there being lots of drowned bees in it. So if you go one to one though, because if we're going into spring, uh, before things get cold or for a summer dearth or something like that, one to one is much better if you want your bees to get out of it and not drowned. So as we get into the fall, cut back on liquids altogether, freezing nights, stop feeding liquids, unless it's what? Pro sweet. And there's no surface area for the bees to drown in. So I'd like to know your thoughts, he says, and those are my thoughts for Ross. So thanks for writing. Question number three. This comes from Dale Harris. It says, I've discovered that while there are hundreds, if not thousands of videos explaining and demonstrating how to expand an apiary by splitting hives, I have yet to find many, if any, videos about how to keep the number of hives in an apiary at a fairly consistent number. Three or four, for example, in an apiary of a hobbyist, backyard beekeeper. What are your thoughts, recommendations on this? Okay, and this is, you know, a lot of people, this is just counterintuitive for them because they're thinking, if your bees are expanding, your colonies are growing, wouldn't you want to have more and more hives and more and more hives? Well, no, because we have a lot of suburban beekeepers and that's one of the reasons I started this channel. This is for backyard beekeepers. 
Often backyard beekeepers are not having a country backyard. They're living in a city somewhere in suburbia where they just happen to be allowed to keep bees. And when they do that, inevitably, there's homeowners associations or there's ordinances that restrict the number of hives that you can have on your property. Most likely it's two. In this case, thank goodness, we have four to go with. So I highly recommend if your limit is four, start with two. <laughs> so, and I'm going to explain why. Because when you have two colonies of bees, if you do things well, if you practice integrated pest management, if you're feeding them healthy, if you have good stock, bee stock is at the top of your pyramid of things that you want to prioritize when you're picking bees for your backyard apiary. So if you've got stock that's good for your environment, and maybe you've picked some varroa resistant stock or some hygienic stock, uh, then you're way ahead and uh, but the problem with some of those is that they like to swarm they like to split they like to reproduce they like to do what all animals exist to do which is reproduce and reproduction happens on two levels inside a beehive one we have daily reproduction because the queen is laying eggs those legs are hatching and they're either drones which are the males or they're hatching out females which are the worker bees so that's reproduction. And then they all go to work and they all support the collective. They all support the superorganism. Now, the superorganism also instinctively wants to reproduce. So know ahead of time, we're fighting nature when we restrict that. And so they reproduce by building up their numbers, storing their resources. And then of course, the old queen ultimately getting pushed out by the workers. When they decide they have enough, they want to create another colony and they want to split and up to 70% of the population of that colony may leave. So this is where bee beekeeping education, staying in touch with your colonies, understanding what they're gonna do when plays a very important role. You can restrict them a number of different ways. Let's say you have two hives, you can't have three. So you need to be on top of your bees. How often do you need to inspect them to know when this is going to happen? It happens most often in springtime. You need to inspect your hives every two to three weeks, minimum. So you need to look and see, are they starting to build queen cells? Are they building swarm cells? Are the numbers getting bigger? So how can you slow that down or even stop it? You can remove the queen. Assuming they're already producing drones, assuming that they already have eggs, assuming that they have brood at all levels and the population is good and they're in every other way healthy, you can sell your queen to somebody or you can start a nucleus colony and then sell the nucleus colony when it succeeds and in the intermediate time frame while that queen is building up in that little nucleus colony, uh, your primary hive feels like, hey, something happened, it's warm, the queen's gone. So then they stop um, creating multiples. They've already got the queen cells that they started. One of those queen cells is going to hatch out. She's going to fly away. And the only part of that that would otherwise change would be that they won't be swarming out and causing trouble in your neighborhood and you won't have to split the colony. Because by removing the queen early on, as soon as you see them, you see a little queen cup in there and they start putting eggs and usually there are multiple queen cups when they're when they really mean it, when they're really trying to build up and get out of there and push that queen out. You'll see multiple queen cups and they will become queen cells. The difference between a queen cup and a queen cell is when there's an egg in there and they're feeding that egg royal jelly and it's going to hatch out of its egg form on the third day and it's going to get copious amounts of resources in there. And that's when uh, you remove your queen. Now we cause a brood break too. So... Take the queen, one frame of brood, frame of uh, resources like honey, because they've got the resources they're building up. They don't build up and plan to swarm unless they're at the leading edge of a uh, nectar flow and unless their population's big. So then you create a little nucleus colony and you work it out with a friend and say, hey, I'm building a nuke and if it succeeds and if they replace their queen, then uh, you can have it later. So that's one way of controlling it. Now what happens, this is why we're holding it in a nucleus Hive, which is usually about five deep frames. Highly recommend that, by the way. And uh, so then she's there. We've got another colony started, baby colony, junior colony. Don't feed them, by the way. Nectar flow is already on. 
We don't want to boost those guys ridiculously. We just got a queen. They just have to take care of themselves, and they do it really well, by the way. So then, your colony that you took your queen out of is dwindling day by day. Instead of producing, she's not laying 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day anymore because the queen's gone. So every day you've lost 1,000 to 1,500 otherwise new workers. So now we're reducing the colony population. That uh, queen cell is going to be capped off on the ninth day after the egg was laid. And on the 14th day, you're going to have a juvenile queen coming out all this time. No eggs are coming out. So you're practicing population control. And then if she flies out, doesn't mate, doesn't come back, and doesn't start to lay eggs again, your emergency resources are over here in your nuclear box. You bring them all back, and you don't even have to do an introduction period. There's no more eggs in the colony. There's no evidence of a queen. And uh, now you can put the old queen back in. So we cause a brood break, and you're good to go. So you have population control. So that's one way. Split and rejoin or split and sell a nuke or give away a nucleus colony to somebody else that wants bees. And it's funny too because that's a question that I actually get a lot from people that have backyard bees. They want to know how to keep the numbers down while the rest of the beekeeping world is trying to expand their colonies as fast as they can to get these big numbers. But uh, that's pretty much it. Question number four. Freemans. Name is Frank, new beekeeper in Melbourne, Australia. According to this episode, number 140, the frames should be pressed tightly against each other, leaving the extra space to the sides. That's my practice. You know, a lot of people can do other things. I have a flow hive, and my mentor had instructed me to have even spacing, which created irregular comb. So by even spacing, spaced out the frames equidistant from one another and left more than the design space in between these frames. <clears throat> so the upper parts of the frame where the honey is. Some frames, you have very deep comb, which corresponds to a shallow comb on the next frame, making the frames harder to pull apart, and you have to put them in the exact order, otherwise the comb will be pressed against the comb on the other frame. A question is as follows. What happens if you press the comb or honey together? Will the bees sort themselves out? Some parts will have little or no bee space. So if we had the face of the frames and like if they were contoured like this, let's do an exaggerated thing. <clears throat> but then you move things around and uh, this has got a bow on this frame here, but now you swap them and they bring one in like this and you push them together and the faces of the cells butt up against each other. Will the bees come through and cut through that and clean it all up? So they possibly can. I mean, it's beeswax, it's honey, and everything else. But I don't recommend you do it. I'll explain why in a second. What is the best way to correct the frames so that the frames are pressed against each other in the middle of the hive? Thanks in advance. So when you get those frames out and you're doing a honey extraction, <clears throat> It's time to get a plane or a nice straight long knife and you're going to shave down the whole surface and make all of your combs the same length so that every frame that you save that's after it's extracted can then be put back in any order. It's always best of course to put your frames back in the same hive they came off of but uh, by shaving them down, because you have an uncapping tank, you're saving it all anyway. You're getting the wax, you're getting the honey. And I like to dress off the fronts so they all match up perfect. <clears throat> so question number five. Gloria Nelson from Wisconsin. I've been told that giving my beehive a gentle tap in the winter to see if they're all still living is the wrong thing to do. My dad always did. So just wanted to clarify the best way to tell if they're alive still. Okay, so here's the thing. First, let's, let's think about the tapping and vibrating and thumping on the hive thing that a lot of people like to do because they go by and they give a knock or they bump it with their hiking stick and then hear a vroom, and then things go back to normal. But let's be the bees for a minute. Inside the hive in the wintertime, things are nice and still. 
Snow's everywhere. They're all clustered up in their mantle, nice and snug over the food and brood and everything else that's going on in there. They seem pretty quiet. That's why we wonder. Are they alive or dead? <clears throat> so you have to ask yourself, what's the benefit to me to know if they're alive right now or if they're dead? If they're dead, are you going to pull apart the hive and do a bunch of maintenance on it right now? Or is it just for peace of mind? I think this is an example of us just wanting to know because we want to know. So how can we find out? So you do that thump. Any vibration. Vibrations at the top of the list for things that annoy bees. So if we go in there and we bang on the hive, you could put them in a defensive alert mode. Maybe it's a bear. Maybe a giant skunk is scratching on it. Maybe we have to fly out and defend the hive, even though we're going to die in the frozen cold. Or maybe just go, oh, what's that? And then they calm all back down. Either way, it's disruptive on whatever level. So I don't recommend thumping on a hive, banging on a hive to find out if the bees are alive, because you have to think in advance on what you're going to do with the information once you have it. Oh, they're alive. Thank goodness. Oh, wait. They didn't do anything. I thumped on it. Didn't do anything. I'm gonna thump it harder. Oh, they still didn't do anything. And uh, so let's assume they're dead. It is an assumption. So would you take it apart right now? Would you would you inspect the hive? And you're gonna find lots of beekeepers with wonderful stories about how they thought a colony was dead. It's winter time. It's a day where it's in the 38 degree range, and it was sunny. So I just I just popped the top to see what's going on. And you just chilled your bees and you just created a challenge for them. So I'm going to recommend something else. <clears throat> First of all, leave your hives alone. When you get these days when it warms up and the sun's shining and bees are doing cleansing flights, that's when you go and you look at the hive to see if anything's going on. And by the way, if they're not flying, it doesn't mean they're dead. It means that they don't need to fly. They don't need anything. It might actually be one of your best colonies that has nothing flying, but this is a stethoscope. It's got the baby side, it's got the adult side. I don't know what stethoscopes cost. I used to be an EMT. And this is left over from that, you know. So, you can take this out there and put it right on the side of the hive and you can listen. Unless you've got a bunch of insulation. If you've got a super insulated hive, this won't work. So, check the lung sounds, all the lobes. Listen. But even slight activity in the hive because they are always doing something, even lightly. Check all sides. Now, which side of the hive would you have the best luck listening to your bees if the cluster is small and they have you concerned? The eastern side of the hive, the side where sunrise is. After the eastern side, it would be the southeastern side if we're in the northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere will be the northeastern side of your hive. <clears throat> so then you'll you'll listen to those areas until you find the little area where they're still alive. Now, thank goodness you know. Because that's really what it is. It's just knowledge. It's knowing that they're alive. It feels good. We want to know how many of our colonies are alive or dead. And then you can kind of plan ahead maybe. Warmer days. If you know that the hive is dead for sure. Uh, you want to keep other hives from robbing them out. So Italian bees, notorious for robbing out other colonies. But if you see your bees are all flying and they're all doing their own thing and there's nobody leaving a hive over here, going into a hive over here, and <clears throat> you could erroneously close off a hive that isn't dead. So unless you see evidence of robbing, what's that? Stuff on the landing board, bits and pieces of wax, stuff being strewn out, bees flying out, their abdomens wiggling around while they organize all the stuff they just stole from this colony before they fly on to their other hive. Those are reasons for concern. We don't want things, we don't want them to be robbed out, so you need to be keen on what's going on with your beehives. But I don't recommend banging on them. The other thing is, more expensive, thermal camera. Look at that too. Again, if you have a bunch of insulation, that's not going to give you a lot of information. So thermals will show you, listen with your stethoscope. Everybody should have a stethoscope anyway. They're good for lots of things. You can find rats and mice in your wall if you had them. You know, a little grinding and chewing. You can listen to termites chewing wood. And of course, you can listen to your family's lung sounds, their heart, and all these other things. So that 
his last question for today. So, that's it. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for watching. If you've got questions for yourself, uh, please write them down in the comment section below. Please visit my website, fredsfindfowl.com. The link will be down in the video description. You can also fill out a form there. And don't forget, if you're one of these people this year, along with the rest of the world, that's using Hive Alive fondant, because it must be amazing stuff, and the bees are eating it, uh, you can also go to my website. You can use your shopping discount code FRED10. Get 10% off. That's it for today. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. And if you're at the Hive Life Conference down in Tennessee, say hello. Glad to see you there.